Hi folks, I'm Chris Leatham. Uh, welcome to The Economy and You. Um, today's guest is none other than the famous Jay Fidel, who's joining us today as my guest. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit today, I think, on a, uh, on a topic that I have been thinking about for a long time. Uh, I wanted to do a show on it. Um, and that's, you know, a show about uh, understanding a little bit about retirement plans and a little bit about finance. You mean the fundamentals of finance? The don't fundamentals you? of finance. That's FOF, isn't it? <laughs> That's watch, right. th watch this. Boom. Remember. Is it going to show up? There, there we is. go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so the you know this is one of those topics, and I was talking to a teenager today, and she says, "Oh, I'm not really interested in finance." I says, "But do you think that it might be important in your life to know something about this?" because we do live in a capitalist country. And I said, do you know what capitalism means? She says, I don't know. I said, it means money. This is a, an economy. We live in a country where the economy is money driven. And Wall Street, and uh, Wall Street is a perfect example of what happens. The, 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 the challenge is though, Jay, there's a lot of young people out there today that really do not have a core or even a basic grasp of what is going on. On, on Wall Street. You know, they, they flip to the channel, and that's the channel that they flip through, CNBC or some of these other channels that talk about what's going on on Wall Street. And I think they flip through them because they don't really understand the vocabulary, the language, or the nuances of what's going on, what, what people are talking about. So I wanted to touch on that just a little bit today. Is that okay? <clears throat> Thoughts. Okay, back in the early days of cable, which meant uh, the early 80s, mm -hmm. um, there was uh, CNBC, I mean, or it just came up at the time, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, Maria Bartiromo, remember her mm -hmm, and all this? Mm -hmm. And it was the day when you could wake up and, and look at cable and you could be in touch with the stock market. That was the first time it really happened. You know, Wall Street, in Wall Street uh, this, this week, remember that? That was, that was good. But that was once a week for half an hour. Yeah. Uh, and it only covered three or four stocks. Now, in the early 80s with cable, um, we, could, we could see minute to minute through pretty much the whole trading day what was going on on the floor. We could see it, and we could hear commentators about it, and we could get graphic representations across the street, screen, and this was new, really new. This was better than listening. To, in fact, I don't think it was on the radio. It well, was only on cable. It was on cable, and today was a perfect example. Uh, 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 Yellen was talking about uh, our new head, head of the Federal Reserve. Um, she was talking, and as she was talking, they had a ticker up by her head. That's scary. Showing the impact on the bond market and the stock market as she was speaking. And she was saying that they're going to have to raise interest rates come soon. Well, they're going to have to come I, up. I, you know, yes. I, I thought to myself when I saw that in the paper <laughs> that, that it would be very interesting to see the national numbers happening while she was saying that, because everybody was watching her. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, many, many years ago, back in the, in the 90s, when I was doing international money management um, out of Indonesia, Southeast Asia, um, I would ask people, who did you think the most powerful person in the world is? And they would say, the, the chair of the Federal Reserve. That is the most important person and most powerful person in the world. Because what happens on Wall Street has a ripple effect through Everyone. all the other markets, all the other economies of the world. So, there you are, the most powerful person in the world. So, let me go further. Okay. So, so now for the first time, we could actually see the floor of the stock market while it was happening. And we could hear people calling up with them, these long cameras, you know, and uh -huh. all wired up to tell us what was happening. And um, there were, in those days, the term day trader became, mm -hmm. became common. In those days, the middle class, the, um, the young executives, the uh, young professionals, uh, they became, if not day traders, they became actively involved in the market. Yes. Uh, and I'll never forget, I, I said to myself, it, life has changed when the electrician who was working in my house came around and, and began to give me stock advice. Yeah. Um, because everybody was into it. Everybody. At that point, you should be concerned. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, it was a whole culture point. It was a, it was a change. And everyone you knew was involved in the market. Mm. Everyone was invested. Everyone was trying to make a fast buck in the market. Um, that, that isn't, 
I don't see that happening now. I think things have changed since then. Things are changing. Um, some of the instruments have changed, some of the policies. You know, there's a tax incentive in play today that if you, if you hold on to a stock for at least a year, that it gets treated as an investment. And so the tax rate is at 15%, as opposed to if it's held for less than that, it's treated as regular income. Mm -hmm. And so you, they've incentivized properly so. Well, that's it's not new, is it? The, well, it's been around a few gain. years. It's tr treated as a capital gain. Yeah. Um, but it is incentivized investing over trading or playing the market. So there are people who say, okay, here's my serious money. I'm going to invest it for the long term. And then there are people who are day trading still. And, and there's all kinds of systems. Yes. And you can buy letters and all this. But my sense of it, see if you agree, is that those young professionals, those young executives, the middle class up and coming, they don't have time for it anymore. And they're not doing it anymore. They're not doing they're it. They're not invested or following or trading in the market. Even though there's all these fabulous tools out there that let you trade pretty much any security in the world in like one second. One second. Yes. Well, and even if you're trading overseas, you have something called ADRs, American Depository it Receipts. It takes long, longer than one second. Yeah, but, but you have, it, it still gives you access to international markets. Yes. For example, if you want to invest in Russia, yes. you can through an ADR. Yes. Um, I, I wouldn't right now. I wouldn't. Well, you know. Well, you know. And, and also they have these, these yeah. baskets of stock, <coughs> I forget what you would call them. Well, you have mutual funds, you have uh, exchange-traded funds, ETFs. ETF, that's ETFs, a, yeah. ETFs. So you can invest in really any market defined, uh, you know, as a specific market. You can you can invest in as an ETF. Yes. I mean, we in that period after the '80s, and when the computer came online to help traders mm -hmm. at home do mm -hmm. their thing, uh, all kinds of new products, new ideas, new ways of disseminating. You. But I don't think, at least not here. I don't think there's a lot of people in, in, in Hawaii and maybe in the country mm -hmm. that, that actually invest in the market. And this, and I, I know you want to talk about retirement plans, but this is a large thing. This is a big thing. Because, you know, as you say, yeah. in a capitalist society, you want to have a lot of people investing. You need to have you, people investing. What, what we have instead is a kind of disparity and the disparity is the rich guys mm -hmm. are richer and the middle class is poorer. The yes. rich guys are investing in the markets, controlling the markets really, yes. all over the world, making money. Making way. money. And yes. the other guys have no knowledge, no interest, no participation. And so they don't, they don't have investment accounts by which they can retire. Well, they, yeah, and here's the, here's the thing, Jay. When you're, when you're young, I was 25 years old the first time somebody took me down to Charles Schwab and said, let me teach you about the stock market. 25. Uh, it was like I, last year. Yeah, yeah, a couple years ago. Um, so anyhow, I, this gentleman took me down there graciously because he really thought that this is something that I needed to know. And he was an older gentleman who befriended me. And uh, his name was Tony Farias. Um, and uh, he took me down there with a couple of other friends. And he said, let me show you guys how this thing works, you know. And that was my first exposure to the stock market. I didn't understand a bid or an ask, or I didn't understand the difference between a bond, a mutual fund, uh, a stock, and I really didn't understand how to invest in any of these instruments. Um, today, the instru instruments are even more complicated. You've got ETFs, you've got options, you've got futures. Derivatives. You've got derivatives, <laughs> yes. And we've got deriv layers of derivatives. And we have the VIX, which is, if, if you weren't confounded by derivatives, here's something called a VIX which blows everything well, away. You know, back in the early yes. 80s with CNBC, they would stop every few minutes and they would teach you about this. Yeah. And if you watched for, you know, an hour a day, I mean, that's a lot, but if you watch for an hour a day, you learn a lot. You become a day trader or have the ability. Now, they don't do that. They assume that you know. They're not going to stop and just teach you about it. And that's another change. Yes. You know? I mean, you certainly have to, you certainly have had to do your homework um, on investment instruments and investing and concepts of investing today, um, it operates at a much higher level of complexity. And, it, and the assumption of what you know is, uh, they do operate um, with that belief that you already understand the terminology and a lot of the characteristics of the market. And also some of the, the, the correlations. You know, when people talk about the bond market, they talk about, you know, the interest rates are going up. 
well, what the people will, some people who don't really understand the market go, well, interest rates going up, isn't that a good thing? Yeah, sure. Anything going up is good. Yeah. Not necessarily, no. No, 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 no. no it's <laughs> not. Because if you're holding long-term bonds, those are treasury notes and treasury bonds, and interest rates go up on the, on the new bonds that are coming out. The ones you own get to be less valuable. The ones that you have are now worth less. So when Janet Yellen says she thinks one day soon they're going to raise interest rates, that, the, the, all the symbols behind her are going down. Yes, you know? yes, yes. This, this, this. <laughs> and, here, and these are the kinds of things, these, these correlations and these understandings. I believe young people, it's an imperative for young people to understand these issues. They really need to take the time. And I'm not here to sort of... Um, but let's look at why they don't, though. Why don't they? One is, uh, you know, it's a long time since the 80s. I mean, that's 40, yes. 40 years, or 35 years. It's a long time. Another generation, or even two or three generations, yeah. have interceded. So it's not the same culture or interest. Uh, secondly, is I think, um, you know, in, in this country anyway, um, we think that somebody will take care of us. You know, we, we're entitled. Yeah. The government will step in, take care of us. So we don't worry too much about retirement and having our own stash. This is this is a big, big, big collective yes. mistake. Yes. The third thing is, uh, I don't, you know, nobody teaches. And so they don't know, and and nobody's stepping out and saying, "Let me show you how it works." Like you had yes. that experience. Yes. And so you know, and they're afraid. And the fourth thing, my last thing. Okay. And then, if you want to take a break, and then we'll take a commercial. That, okay? <laughs> <laughs> the, the fourth thing is that the the market, you know, doesn't it goes up and down. Now, there's no surprise. It always went. It's up supposed down. to. But in the '80s, it was really riding up. At yeah. least for the first part of the '80s, yeah. and everybody's saying, "I want to eat my electrician." I'm going to get in. I'm going to make money. You know, this is uh -huh. you know, this is worth the effort of learning because I'm going to make more money in the market than I do in my job. You mm -hmm. know, it's no longer the case. You, you get in, you think you're a smart guy, and then you lose money. Well, there are and smart you have no people. No level of confidence about it. Well, there are smart people on both sides of the trade. That's the thing to understand. You're not necessarily smarter than the guy who's. If you're buying, the guy who's selling thinks he's smarter than you. So that's part of it. Let's come back. I want to talk a little bit more about this and get into some of the actual nomenclature or terminology um, that young people might really find helpful. Great. Okay, we'll be right back. I'm Chris Leatham, and this is Economy and You. Stay tuned. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right and what's good and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week, we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Aloha, we're back. I'm Chris Leatham. This is The Economy and You. Today's guest is Jay Fidel. Um, I'm still getting used to this new studio, Jay. I have to tell you, I got the two cameras here. I got uh, the cameras and the videos. I'm not quite sure where to look. But um, if you want to say it's beautiful, feel it free is to do gorgeous, that. though. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. gorgeous. Yeah, 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 it is. Um, I, um, but we're, we're talking about all these sort of these, these issues with young people not investing in the market or if they have a retirement plan. They've set up a retirement plan, uh, 401k. They're putting some money in it. Uh, but when I talk to young people, I say, well, what did you put your money into? One, they, they either don't know or they put it in something terribly conservative, and they're young. Now, the thing that I, I always, that, that the advice that was given to me was that invest more aggressively when you're young. You'll earn a higher rate of return over time. Yes, you'll accept a higher level of volatility, and if people know what volatility is, it's, that's when the market goes up and it comes down. It goes up and it comes down, and that's the nature of the stock market. Uh, it's driven by all kinds of forces. Um, but over the long term, more aggressive investments tend to earn a much higher level of return. Uh, you know, more aggressive investments earn a higher rate of return over time. And if you are only investing in something that gives you essentially the inflation rate, your money really isn't growing. Right. So 
you know, we want to talk about um, some of the, the, the key terms here now. Before we get to that. Yes, okay, go ahead, you know, Jay. Go ahead. You know, we, we live in a world uh -huh. where uh, the stock market is very, uh, at least in the market itself, very high tech. I remember a, uh, I guess it's a 60 Minutes piece, some kind of revela revelationary piece a year or two ago, uh -huh. where they found these scammers were uh, intercepting the trade signals. Uh -huh. Remember this? <coughs> yes. Uh, off Wall Street. And uh, they were capitalizing on that to earn a lot of money, a penny or two in each case. Uh -huh. But with lots of trades, yes. they earned millions and millions of millions of dollars be simply because of the speed with which these trades were being fulfilled. Uh -huh. It's really amazing that they could earn so much money that way. Well, you know, they have there's banks of computers on Wall Street. There's just buildings full of computers. And the reason that they are sitting so close to the trading floor is because of the inherent speed, speed that is just infinitesimally faster than the next guy to take advantage of trading, of a trade. Now, what they're doing is they're doing a lot of arbitrage trading. And arbitrage trading is you're buying in one place and you're selling somewhere else. And you're making money off the disparity. So you may be buying on the London Exchange and selling on the New York Exchange. But you have exchange, to have the speed. But you've got to have the speed. And who gets their first wins? This is why they have set up all these incredibly fast computer systems. Now, does that mean that you and I cannot make money on Wall Street? No. No, but we're, we're at a disadvantage compared to the guys that have the speed on Wall Street. Yeah, but remember, they also had to invest millions of dollars in those computer systems, and they have to keep them up, and they have to be working all the time. And, you know, that's all great until the next guy comes along, and he's got something infinitesimally faster. Well, our whole mindset has to be different. We, yeah. You know, they say, you know, invest for the long term. And that's probably smart, because you don't have all day to You've got to come down and do shows here at Think Tank. That's right. And yeah. so do I. <laughs> so it's not like you can spend all day. You're not a day trader. No. So, you know, you need to invest with a different horizon, different time horizon than those guys. The other thing is, <clears throat> as a person who is removed from Wall Street, who is not there, I, I remember all those, those restaurants and bars mm -hmm. where information would pass. You know, inside information would pass, and these guys had all say these Say it isn't so, Jay. Yeah. Say, say that, that that doesn't really happen on Wall Street. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> Every day. <laughs> but, you know, we're far, far away from that. Yeah. We don't have access to that kind of instant information, rumor mill, whatever you want to call it, that enables you to make a, make a buck. So we have to rely on good research, yes. prudent thinking, and all that. Mm -hmm. Third thing I want to mention in that connection is... Uh, We've seen a bit a couple of you know movies, popular movies in the past few years, um, about how local I mean, local people, but middle class people, are busted by getting deceptive information from erstwhile brokers, brokers who tell them things that aren't true, brokers who are in conflict and trying to sell stock that isn't worth it, you know the powder, uh, and people don't re they they accept that advice, uh, they buy that stock and they lose money on it when they should have been better advised. And so you have this whole credibility thing and potential deception. Even with all the securities laws, even with all the protections, yes. people get ripped off all the time. So you have to be prudent. You have to have a good advisor. Yes. And you have to you know, invest in a, you know, the most rational way possible. Well, you, you, you know, one of the first rules of investing is diversification. Diversify, diversify, diversify. You diversify your portfolio by, by um, first off, don't put all your eggs in one basket in any way, shape, or form. Maybe you have multiple accounts set up with different brokerage houses and you're getting advice from different people. Um, there are morning services like um, uh, investment services or review services like Morningstar, for example, that independently rates mutual funds and stocks. Value Line is another one. They do an independent evaluation and they're constantly updating their, their data. And they're, what they look at as performance, they look at cost, they look at volatility, they look at something, um, um, you, know, with, you know, how does a money manager add value? And there are different ways that managers add value. If you're investing yourself, and, I, and basically the rule of thumb is if you don't have a million dollars, you probably want to be putting your money into mutual funds. Why? Well, because mutual funds give you that diversification. Uh, or ETFs. ETFs are another way of getting, uh, or index funds are another way, uh, another way of having diversification of your portfolio. Um, and that helps to mitigate 
those sort of investments that you make from bad brokers and people like mm -hmm. that. Well, you can have bad mutual funds too. There's you no, can. There's no law against a bad mutual fund, and uh, you can you know you can bypass the uh, the research aspect and and take it on say so. Maybe your electrician will tell you which mutual fund he likes. Or your shoe shine guy. Or your you shoe shine yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. Before you know it, you lost your money. Yes. Uh, with a mutual fund, with all kinds of prospecti and this and that. Uh -huh. So <clears throat> research does pay off, and there are lots of ways. Third party, you know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. re you know, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, credible. Rep reputable. Reputable sources of information and rating information. Right. Rating one mutual fund against another. But you know, if you don't watch out, you're gonna be in the bottom of the pile with they're gonna lose it. Not necessarily so. <laughs> Not necessarily so. Now I will say, um, if you if you've diversified your investments, and that means also not putting all your eggs in one mutual fund. If you have a, an, an array of mutual funds, and, and this is, goes to something called asset allocation. So you may have a mutual some mutual funds that are more aggressive. Maybe you're picking bigger stocks that are part of the Dow Jones industrial average. Um, and you're following Dow theory, and then you may have some that are in uh, moderate size companies, and then you may have others that are invested in small caps. And these are small, more aggressive companies that are more speculative, they're more volatile. But again, if you're looking at funds that have had good long-term money man history of money management, now one of the things that you look at at a mutual fund is you look at who's managing the, that fund. And if you're looking at the performance of a fund over time and it's had the same manager and you haven't seen anything atrocious happen, you know, one of the things that can cause a mutual fund to go bad is it does really, really well. And all of a sudden, everybody starts piling in on top of, you know, on, on this fund and say, oh, this guy's great. He's, he's, he's getting me, you know, 20% return. I don't understand that. Is he less great because they come and they like him? Yes, yes. Sometimes what happens is too much money breaks the methodology that a money manager is using and then it, then what happens is he starts to underperform and so that's one of the things how, that you how look do you at you know he's any good it's only by history huh you can't read his bio and find out he's a nice person. well actually you can find out a little quite a bit about somebody yeah. okay. you know on their bios you know is okay. the uh and when i worked uh for kemper one of the things that we looked at is things simple things like is he get his stable marriage is he uh you know, is everything going right? Is he paying his taxes? Is he doing all the things that he's supposed to be, be doing? What's his credit score like? You know, if his credit score all of a sudden goes through the floor, you know, that's a, that's a good sign you may want to take your money out away from this guy. Bernie Madoff. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, but yeah. you know, the thing is that you're talking about a pretty uh, serious uh, kind of investigation there. Why, why don't I just go to Morningstar and check the number of stars? Well, Morningstar does these kinds of things. Value Line and Morningstar do do their research you have to pay on money for managers. Morningstar, don't you? Huh? You have to pay for it. Um, you can pay for it, but you know there are other sites that have Morningstar information. Uh, for example, Fidelity, uh, Merrill Lynch, they uh, subscribe to Morningstar information, and then they publish that um, within their own analysis of mutual funds. So if you went to Merrill Lynch and you look, took a look at their stuff, you can see uh, Morningstar ratings on funds um, and value line ratings. And, and then you can go in, if you look at individual stocks, um, they will tell you on a lot of these sites that for different investment houses, they will tell you how different money managers rate a particular stock, whether they think it's a buy, sell, or hold, and sort of give you a, a, an idea of what other money managers think of a particular stock. Um, and here's the thing. These guys that work on Wall Street do have access to a lot of data. They pay for it. Um, and to, and to think that you have more information or more insight than they, than they do is probably folly, okay? So it's good, it's, there are lots of resources to help you, and you want to invest according to your own risk tolerance. But before you get to that, yes. though, you know, you may, you may, I mean, I'm mechanical about this, okay? okay. I, look at, I look at rating system one, okay. and then I look at rating system two, and I look at rating system three, and maybe even four, uh -huh. okay? And if I see that all three or four of them say, yes, buy that mutual fund or yeah. buy that stock, uh -huh. I feel pretty comfortable. Not, not necessarily that I'm sure I'm going to make money with it, but because I'm doing the right thing. I'm satisfying my need, you know, to, to do the due diligence. I, if I get all these people okay, saying but you yes. You still have to have your own buy and sell disciplines, Jay. Now, suppose I have, out of those okay. three, three of them are good. Okay. Uh, two of them are good, and one of them is in the tank. Okay. He says sell. He's he saying don't, he sell don't it, do get it. rid don't of it. Don't do it. Don't yeah. bad idea, you know. <laughs> so mm, I have to rate the rater. 
okay? Uh -huh. And I have to figure out why the clunker over here is going the other direction. And how do uh -huh. I do that, actually, Chris? Well, he's going to give you some... There, there I mean, is difference of opinion Well, they, about they have this. opinions, and they'll tell you why their opinion is. And the thing is, is you may agree or disagree with his opinion. His opinion may be based on something like he's predicting what interest rate valuations, for example, Today we're talking about raising interest rates, 25 basis points, and how this is going to impact um, the financial sector. You know, we have different sectors in our stock market. We have finance, transportation, have various uh, the technology sectors, and they're going, well, you know, if interest rates go up, then that sector, the financial sector, will go up. And it has over the last, in anticipation of an interest rate increase, we have seen over the last several weeks an 8% rise in the finance sector on the stock market. But, you know, this could be unbridled exuberance, you know. You may be getting in right now well, going, it's going to go up term, more. What's Unbrid that? Unbridled uh, uh, exuberance. exuberance. <laughs> <laughs> so people are going, oh, look at this. This is going up wonderfully. That, that, that raises a much larger question. Uh -huh. you know? So you're talking about getting up in the morning and looking at the, the rating agencies, rating the stocks, and then making a decision on what, what you feel intuitively is the best thing, mm -hmm. and then buying or selling on that basis. Well, for that matter, you know, um, um, getting a letter, investment letter, yes. on stocks or mutual Somebody funds. Somebody who's or, giving you their you know, insights. Yeah. Okay, you know, all kinds of advice. And, and paying for that and presumably getting real talent who writes the letters. And some of them are really good and well, very thoughtful. But th that's the kind of the short-term ebb and flow of things, I think. What about the long-term aspect? You know, people say, for example, that the economy of the United States is basically in the decline. And you can have NASDAQ going over 5,000, that's very nice. Um, but is it, is it, is it in, in the long term, is that going to continue? How do you keep your eye on that picture? I know you're going to tell me after this coming break. Okay, well, when we come back to it from our next break, we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. But um, it also, and you also have to look at how the, the United States operates uh, within all the other, uh, it could, as it operates relative to all the other countries yes. and economies yes. of the world. Yes, more now than ever. Yes, the dollar has been going through the roof. You know, we've seen a rise. The, the yen is now trading around 123, 124 yen to the dollar. Uh, a few years ago, it was a, a year ago, it was 100 yen to the dollar. So then, Same with the euro. Yeah, well, the, and the euro has, has fallen um, significantly. Uh, we have been printing dollars like it's going out of style, but so is the uh, Japanese, and so has the Europeans. And, of course, we've got the whole Greece debacle, which may be a short-term thing, but, of course, it's causing a lot of pain and suffering in the European, mar in the European market. So you go to these rating agencies or stockbrokers, yes. and they tell you that, you know, they're doing technical analysis and charts and graphs and these mysterious black box formulas, they don't tell you how it works. Okay, and that's very nice. But if something happened in Europe right now, uh -huh. you know, to drop the euro further than it's already dropped, or in Japan, uh -huh. drop the yen further than it's already dropped, or, or Janet Yellen comes up with another... And she's going to raise this a full 1% instead right, of 25 basis yeah. points. <laughs> that's going to affect your stock no matter what those rating guys have said. It will, but and not so necessarily long-term. how do you build term. that into your model? I'm a middle class, young professional, young, young executive, and I want to protect, protect my stash. I okay. don't want to lose it. How do I hedge against world events that nobody, nobody can predict? Keep your money under your mattress. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. You learned it here on ThinkTech. <laughs> well, we're going to go to commercial. Uh, I think Sachi might be ready. Are you ready for us to go to commercial, Sachi? I'm Chris Leatham. Um, this is Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, today's guest is Jay Fidel. We're talking about the stock market. And we'll be right back. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I host a show called Healthcare in Hawaii here on Think Tech. We get together once a week or sometimes uh, twice a month. Depends. When we're busy, we get together less often. But we'd love to see you here to talk about the preeminent healthcare issues in our state. Our programs vary very widely. We talk about economics, we talk about health care, we talk about social issues on this program. Thanks for joining us. Aloha, I'm Hunter Hevelin, host of Sustainable Hawaii here at Think Tech Hawaii. You can tune in every week on Thursday at 2 p.m. to see interviews with sustainability professionals from around the state and even further abroad, learning about activities with water management, food security, waste management, and a whole host of other 
uh, fascinating opportunities to get engaged with making a greener island. So if you're interested in making the transition from consuming, produ consuming individuals to communities of producers, check us out every Thursday. Aloha. You should globalize it. Okay, we're back. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham. This is The Economy in You. Today's guest is Jay Fidel. And so we were going to start off with um, just sort of telling people how to make money in the stock market for sure. Okay. Yes. Yeah, write this down. Yeah, yeah. Write this down. Okay. It's an old Chinese secret. <laughs> Buy low, sell high. Thank you. That's that's it. <laughs> so, um, but you know, I think one of the things that you know, that scares people is they don't really understand all the terminology and all the correlations, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, all these things. I just want people to know that they can go to places like Fidelity or Merrill Lynch. They can call these people up, and they are so happy on the phone to sit there and explain to you in detail how all these things work. Um, so don't be afraid to pick up a phone and just ask somebody, you know, call these people and say, hey, look, I really don't understand this stuff. Could you explain it to me? Um, and they are very happy to sit there and talk with you. You know, I remember years ago, I don't think you can do this now, uh -huh. but I had, I had one connection with one stockbroker and they were open like 24 hours a day and they had guys who would talk to you. And uh, I, I, I was working hard. I'd be leaving my office here downtown at like 10 o'clock at night. And uh, invariably, those are the days when you could actually get a cell phone and, uh, and call from your car. Remember those? That's a long time ago. I, I don't you remember actually those. make a call from, from your car. From your car. You can make a car phone. How about that? Okay. Okay. So and I would like call. the Batmobile. <laughs> <laughs> I would call this particular stock house uh -huh. and invariably there would be somebody there in a matter of seconds and he would be my, my guru, uh -huh. my, uh, my therapist. <laughs> You know, I would tell him how my day was. He would yes. tell me how his day. This is, you know, thousands of guys were out there performing the service. But the idea was that we could talk about, we did talk, and they were willing and authorized to talk about global events and how those things would affect the market. I thought that was very useful. Because I think, you know, you do better if you always have a, a kind of a global view of it uh, and that, you know, you can, you can feel it coming one way or the other. You can feel events that... Wall, I mean, Wall Street, they're all mammals, too, you know. Mm -hmm. You can quote me on this. They're all mammals on Wall Street. Yes. And they react to the global events, too. They do, and they're very reactionary. You know, one of the things that, you, that actually works in your favor, if you watch, watch people on Wall Street, they are very reactionary to, to the events that occur around the world, and they tend to oversell and overbuy things based on very reactionary uh, activities. And, and a lot of this is driven by options trading. You know, options traders tend to drive the prices of stocks uh, up and down very in it's a very volatile, yeah, they, it's highly leveraged. And so what happens is it tends to push stocks up and down a lot more than they really would, except for what happens on the options market. But if you want to talk about the impact globally about what happens, you know, when we talk about investing for the long term, you know, we do have to take a look. We're no longer isolated within the United States. We are part of a world economy and things, what, what goes on in Russia, what goes on in Iran, what goes on in Europe and Japan and China, all has an impact on us. Uh, we are now talking about a, a glo uh, this new uh, Pacific Trade Agreement. TPP. TPP. You know, that is going to have an impact on our markets. It's going to have an impact on our economy. It's going to have, an, um, you know, a, a lot of corporations today are multinational. Um, for example, we just saw today in the news, we saw that there is now Uber uh, has to now start treating its drivers as employees instead of uh, independent contractors. Well, that's going to have a huge impact on their business model. Only if it gets affirmed. Only if it gets it, affirmed. It, the news is that it's on appeal. That's what the news yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but in, in these kinds of legal, you know, there are always risks. There are, are inherent risks with, um, you know, val cur currency valuations. Obviously, if you're a Japanese investor and you had invested in the United States, no matter what you bought, just the ver mere fact that the currency has gone up by 20, over 20% 20 in the last year means that you're a big time winner. So is this, As a Jap from is a Japanese this too perspective. much for me? I mean, suppose I'm the guy down the block or, you know, across town, uh -huh. who's my, you know, young professional, young executive, what have you, you know, making a middle class living. Um, is this overwhelming for me? Should, and I think a lot of people, it is overwhelming. They don't want to, they don't want to go into those places, you know. Th thank you. Thank you, Chris Latham. Uh, but we don't want to know about this because it's too complicated okay. for us. And we're going to lose our money if we do that. 
So we're not doing it. Well, there, and therein lies the rub, isn't it, Jay? I mean, therein lies the rub. Because if you don't play, you can't win. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yes. <laughs> you have to be in to win. And so the question is, where do you go? Well, you do seek good advice. You also make sure that you set up your own buy and sell disciplines. If you buy something and you say, okay, look, my risk tolerance is, if it loses 10% from where, wherever I bought it, sell it. Sell it no matter what. I'm just going to sell it. It may come back up, and so what? I, that's, my, that's my sell discipline. Everybody knows when to buy. You buy when, the, when something... Sell, selling is much harder. Yeah. When to sell something is way more difficult than when to buy it. Yeah. So it means you have to set up your own sell discipline. They may be painful at times, yeah. but you implement them. So if it goes up 12% from where I bought it, then maybe I sell off half of it. If it goes up 18%, I sell off another half of it. You know, it's, it's identifying where your eyes and your stomach meet. Yeah. You know, that's the important it's thing. It's scary, but, you know, it's something you've got to do for your own self. I mean, I, the government is not here to help you. And the government isn't going to take care of you. And your company, you know, the days of having your company, you come work for a company and they ha take care of you and from cradle to grave, you could basically say those days are gone. Yes, I agree. And so it is on you as a, a citizen of this country, which is a capitalist nation, to understand our capital markets. And, and let's take it to Hawaii. Yes. In, in Hawaii, you know, one of the sad things about the tech industry, you know, <coughs> and I talked about this, is that there was no, virtually no local investment going into it here. How yeah. can you build a tech industry without local investment? I mean, if you go to Silicon Valley, they got a lot of people there ready to write a lot of big checks for you. I mean, you, you don't even have to call them. They'll call you. Yes. They want to invest in anything tech. Mm -hmm. And that's how Silicon Valley got started. And we don't have that. We may have some talent, or over the years we have had some, I think a lot of them have gone, uh, some talent, but there was no money here. The uh, Kamehameha Schools never invested. The ERS, the Pledge Retirement System, never invested. Right. And worse, the individual stock, you know, the individual investor person yes. uh, never invested. I wrote an article once for the Honolulu, Star, uh, Honolulu Advertiser uh -huh. for the proposition that we ought to have a tech fund and anyone here, and you can buy shares in the tech yes. fund, and somebody meant, like you, somebody would manage a tech fund and put that money into Hawaii tech companies. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's somebody actually... somebody must have read the article, but that's, it stopped there. Yeah, you know, that's actually a fine idea. And the, th the thing that you have to, have to understand is you have to first build faith in that model. Whatever you develop, you have to build faith in that model by having some successes. And we're having some, some successes mm -hmm. now. Yeah. We have... Um, True Tag, uh, which is a success story. We have these young people from UH that are now developing uh, testing tools to test for um, viruses and, and things that damage our crops. Um, they are doing amazing work. Um, we continue to do uh, some very interesting projects that have phenomenal opportunity and you know, potential for success. Uh, but we, yes, we have to put together, I think, some kind of fund like that, if we could put that. And then what we need to do is provide an incentive, whether it's a tax incentive by making, having a tax-free return, um, if it's a bond portfolio or a mix of stocks and bonds or something like that, where there is it's incentive, we provide a local incentive for people to invest. One of the things I had thought about was that we have all these people coming to Hawaii to buy real estate from other countries. Now, when they sell their real estate, uh, they pay a, a tax, I think it's 10% or something, and then they take their money and they leave. Wouldn't it be great if we said, hey, look, we won't charge you that 10% if you leave it in the country for another six or seven years and invest in our technology fund? That's a great idea. You know, if we say, look, rather than exporting your money, taking your money out of the country, we're going to give you something. We're yeah. going to give you a sweetheart deal here yeah. that only you can get because yeah. you're a foreign investor in the United States where we're going to... to um, waive that that tax yeah. liability it's not federal just state state less than federal you know in terms of the, the tax you uh -huh. pay so uh yeah that would be great it would, it would incentivize them to stay around and it yeah. would it would fill those coffers with money to help us develop our technology and industry these entrepreneurs motivated that's right yes you know, and the thing about tech is uh -huh. that you need the money now yes you can't wait it's not the horatio right. alger story you know where you you build another buggy whip and somehow uh -huh. that you know and you make it up over time. No, you need it right now. You have to go to market right now. Well, it's time to market in technology. It's all about time to market. Yeah. It's time, to, time you develop it and you can get it out there. I do want to put in a good word for Startup Weekend.
by the way, Jay, which is coming up. We talk about technology, Startup Weekend, um, At The Box Jelly, I believe it's Friday around 6 o'clock. Um, and so if you have not been to Startup Weekend, folks, if you haven't been to a Startup Weekend and you want to see what our young tech entrepreneurs are capable of doing, this is a great event to come and attend and just enjoy yourself and listen and see what these young people are doing. It's absolutely amazing. And if you have bucks to invest, you can probably there you find go. some way <laughs> to actually yes. help them out. Help them out, yeah. <laughs> if, if it's nothing more than buying pizza, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> I'd love to have them. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how much time we have left, Sachi. Are we about out of time? We've got five minutes left. Great. Okay, so let's talk about um, maybe a little bit about retirement planning, okay, because, you know, too many young people are putting off planning for their retirement uh, because it seems a little overwhelming. There's a few few basic plans this that I would like uh -huh. that global issue. Okay. You know, except I, I think it's actually more important than the global issue because ultimately you are going to get old. Yes. And you don't know exactly what's going to happen to Social Security down there, down that road. Right. If the government gets weaker, and probably it will, you won't have as much Social Security, uh, and you won't. You'll have to rely on yourself. And we have multiple generations in the pipeline now who are not saving for retirement. They're not saving for retirement. They're not forced to. It's not like right. Obamacare, you know, where you must do it. You don't have to do it. You can go hand to mouth, spend your whole paycheck, every single payday, and at the end of the line, you'll die poor. Yes, Ogbandino wrote a book called The Richest Man in the World. And in the book, he said, if you're a smart person, you'll work the first half of your life for your money. In the second half of your life, you'll let your money work for you. That's a great idea. Great yes. way to put it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, one of the reasons that retirement planning is important is because you are going to get there. The question is, where do you begin? Simple things that you can do is set up an IRA. You have a, a standard IRA. You have a, what's called an individual re retirement account. Today, I think you could put about $5,500 into it. You can do a Roth IRA, which allows you to put in after tax dollars, you can do, um, and then you have something called a 401k plan, which a 401k plan is a sort of an addendum to a profit sharing or what they call a defined contribution plan. A defined contribution plan is a plan where you, the, the laws define how much you can put in or contribute. Yeah, it's, it's determined, it's, it's defined by how much you put in. Right. Rather than how much you, you take, take out. out. Now, what you take out is called a defined benefit plan. Which is much more expensive and heady and for much richer people. And, <laughs> well, you know, the government had defined benefit plans, and basically it said, well, look, when you retire, we're going to give you X percentage of the money that of, your, of your final average salary. So if your final average salary was 100000 a year, um, hopefully, and uh, they, they said they were going to fund 50% of that, then you retire with fifty thousand a year, yeah. and you would get that. that um, but that's p not for the average Joe. Not anymore. Uh, the reason that defined benefit benefit plans went out to vote, I think, had to do with changes in what they called the vesting schedule. The vesting schedule used to be uh, a much longer duration, where you had a twenty, forty, sixty, eighty, one hundred uh, percent, and it took many years to get fully vested. Today, right. the vesting schedule is much shorter. So by, by the end of three years, it's you're fully law. vested yeah. by law. They changed the laws, right? So the yeah. vesting schedules uh, became much tighter. The rules became much more uh, strict about how much money you had to put in for each employee. Uh, more employees had to be participating in the plan. And so um, but, but the reality that changed. Old-fashioned pension profit-sharing plans yes. are no longer popular among employers. And they right. don't have to create them. They don't have to form them, uh, <coughs> yes. and now it's all about 401k and, and some of these other products. Right. Well, what they've, what they've done is they've uh, basically said, here's the liability, because there was a liability that came with it. And they said, you know, we no longer want to accept that liability. We're going to give it to you, the employee. Your liability of managing it. Managing the money, yes. And so now that's why we have IRAs and uh, 401ks. Where the employee manages. Yes. And if he doesn't do due diligence, make some mistakes about buying stocks or bonds, it's his problem. That's right. Which is, I mean, oh, that sounds very Republican, I'm yes. sorry to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's do another show. We can talk more about this. Um, and thank you for watching today. Uh, this is The Economy and You. This is uh, with Chris Letham and Jay Fidel. And look forward to seeing you next week, Wednesday at 3 p.m. Aloha.